Hey everybody, welcome to another edition of Liam's Hockey. And yeah, normally it would be this day in hockey, but deviating from this one a little bit here on Monday, the start of another, I would say, work week. But for many of us, uh, we're not quite there yet. I know some of you uh, have been able to keep the occupation going, but really wanted to recap a couple things from the weekend, mostly the replaying of the 87 Canada Cup, of which I watched every single second. I missed a special on the uh, 1970 Bruins last night, Big Bad and Bobby. Uh, hopefully that will be replayed again, and I would like to see it. And I'm wearing my uh, Bobby Orr Hall of Fame t-shirt tonight to celebrate the 50th anniversary of his goal yesterday. I've got a funny little story for you there. Came came about to me, came to me yesterday through Instagram, actually. But I want to talk about the 87 Canada Cup first. I watched every game. It, it is funny, isn't it? I saw a lot of commentary on social media. I can only imagine for anybody that did watch it, if you actually dedicated the time to it and sat down and watched, like took time to actually watch the games as they would have been presented back then for the overwhelming majority of us outside of the 16, 17,000 who were fortunate enough to be in the buildings, the Montreal Forum and Cops Coliseum for games two and three. If you watch the games, it's really difficult to uh, watch knowing the way the games have been called the last few years. To see, oh my God, it is it is crazy, right? I think maybe, if anything, I was kind of hoping that would give some people an idea that if Wayne and Mario, in particular, could play in today's game without the hooking and holding and obstruction that went on back then and with no red line and, and in today's equipment and obviously would have grown up in a different nutritious world, all of those things, training and everything, that uh, they, they would be so freaking dominant offensively, as would Bobby Orr, that, uh, that their numbers would certainly substantiate the fact that they are regarded by many, myself included, as the four greatest hockey players of all time with Gordie Howe. There is no doubt in my mind about that, and that was, if anything, cemented watching that Canada Cup. There's a couple of things about it. First of all, uh, going into it, uh, I think it was interesting for a lot of people to get a look at Norman Rushfort. You have to keep in mind that uh, Larry Robinson had hurt himself in a polo incident in the summer, so he was unavailable. And the Canadians went largely with a Paul Coffey, Ray Bork, Larry Murphy trifecta with Craig Hartsburg throwing in and then a smattering of others. Norman Rushfort, I thought, played outstanding. I mean, he jumped in the offense. He contributed there. He used his big body. I thought he was good down low. I mean, you know, there was 33 goals scored in the, in the three games, Canada winning two of them. So the goaltending got lit up, at least in terms of the scoreboard. But this is a situation where all the goaltenders, Grant Fuhrer in particular, made numerous, unbelievable saves in all three games, not the least of which was off Krutov. The very first time I met Grant at the Marshes Golf Club out in the west end of Ottawa, and I had a chance to shake his hand. We played golf together. The very first thing I said to him was, thanks for making that save off Krutov and double OT. We were that close to losing two straight. Instead, we come back and win that one on uh, great play down low, Wayne and Mario again and, and, and uh, in double OT. And we forced game three and we all know what happened. But I wanted to give a shout out to Norman Rushford. I thought he was outstanding. So the speculation that perhaps Scott Stevens should have made the team I think you could look right then and there, myself anyway, and look back and say, yeah, I think they got it right. I think Scott Stevens had nowhere near that type of mobility in 1987. He was nowhere near becoming the destructive force and, and the combination of, of power and, and, uh, and ability and, and just, uh, just physical intimidation. Not to say he wasn't tough as nails in 87 by August and September of 87. He certainly was. I'm just trying to substantiate the fact that I thought Rushworth played incredible. Dougie Gilmore, you could see Mike Keenan making adjustments on the fly, especially game two. Uh, Gilmore getting more ice time. I, I actually sat down in game one and, and, uh, and wrote notes. I was writing down line combinations. I had six different line combinations that Wayne Gretzky was part of. Six in game one. I mean, what the hell are you going to do? The guy scored 200 points a year. I'd be playing with everybody too. So the Wayne and Mario show, such as it was, was really only existing on the power play. Uh, but, um, you know, I uh, want to give credit to the Russians. They played great. I don't think the better team uh, lost that series. That's the other sort of avant-garde thing that's been come the uh, uh, sort of the sexy thing to say. Wow, yeah, oh, the Russians. They actually were the better team. And, uh, you know, 
No, they weren't. No, they weren't. They weren't the better team in 72. They weren't the better team in 76. They weren't the better team in 84. They weren't the better team in 87. They weren't the better team when we beat them uh, in, in the, uh, when else did we play them? 2010? 20, did we play them in Sochi? I don't think we did. Anyway, the majority of times that we've played them, the overwhelming majority of times, I mean, in 84 may be the time that they were superior. Smoked us pretty good in the round robin, and we beat them in overtime in the semifinal. Uh, they might have been as good or better, I'll grant you that. There wasn't one other time, including this one, where I felt they were the better team. They were every bit an equal. They really were. And they did a lot of things that I really liked. I, I, I really did. The KLM line was outstanding. They're saying Larry Onoff was playing hurt. Uh, it was interesting to see the panel show that they did because it went back to 2012. I didn't quite pick up on that right away. And uh, by, when I did, because we had just been on with Mike Keenan the night before. I was going, something looks different. <laughs> His hair. Because he's fighting prostate cancer. And uh, we did the Philadelphia Flyer Warrior, or the um, uh, Flyers Decades alumni hit on Zoom, on YouTube, live on YouTube the night before that, and Keenan was on. And uh, so that was taped in 2012. But I thought it was a good job. The guys did a good job. That'd be a little difficult for Larry Onoff sitting there in the middle. But I thought there was some good comments made by all three of them, Keenan, Larry Onoff, and Larry Murphy, hosted by Mike Johnson. Found it interesting. Anyway, Doug Gilmore and his limited ice time, I thought, was outstanding. There were so many great plays. Paul Coffey. Man, you just had to really be blown away by how well he played. I, I mean, he was absolutely outstanding. When, when you look at the back-to-back -back Norrises he won, because keep in mind, he had like a 130-plus point season when Langway beat him that one year for the Norris Trophy. Again, just, just, just voters out thinking themselves, right? Thinking, oh my God, you know, it's not all about offense and we've got to go to a defensive guy and who's the best defensive defenseman that's Rod Langway easily, and he won back-to-back -back Norris's while everybody tried to grab a brain and figure it out. And nor should it every year go to the player with the most points, most the defenseman with the most points. It shouldn't be an automatic. But boy, oh boy, when you look at Coffey in that Canada Cup, and you think of uh, not only that, but even his play in 84, maybe they'll show us that at some point in time, that semifinal win in OT over Russia in 84. One of the games that just doesn't get talked about hardly at all. Anyway, it was just outstanding. Winning game two, spectacular. Missed calls and calls left on the ice all over the place. It went both ways. There was diving. You saw Wayne diving and getting a call and then, and, in game two. And then he, he dove two or three more times and Paul Stewart didn't call it. He, he, he didn't call it. He was obviously on to it. Uh, but some, some of them got calls. Some of the Russians got calls. There were cheap shots, probably favoring Canada. A little bit more there. They're more aggressive for sure. If they turned that part of the game up, uh, uh, my, my roommate here, Peter Oliver, was remarking how Craig Hartsburg just absolutely destroyed everything that moved in game one. Uh, Mark Messier in game two pretty much destroyed everything that moved. It's funny, he was on the call on Thursday night too, right? With the, uh, with the Flyer alumni, he jumped on. That was so such an amazing event for me to be a part of. But uh, we're going to do another one coming up soon too. But anyways, I digress. So you get on to game three. And we're down 3-0. That's September 15th, 87. I'll never forget it, obviously. I was watching that with my roommate today. Uh, you know, he, he and I and four other guys watched that on Forrester Crescent in Bell's Corners. If you're familiar with the hamlet of Bell's Corners in the west end of Ottawa, there's a, a Forrester Crescent. is one of the many roads that winds its way in through the subdivisions in there. And, uh, and that's where we were that fateful night. When we got the phone call, specifically my roommate, because he knew that uh, they knew he was there, uh, to let us know that our dear friend Jack Gaynor had passed away the night before from suicide. And uh, Canada was losing 3 nothing. Then we get the news that Jack had died. You want to talk about a despondent group. And it was um, something I'll never, ever forget. Because when Canada started coming back, 3-1, 3-2... And when they made it 3-2, Andy Brown, who was sitting there, his brother's Joel Brown, who fought Bob Probert five times in the OHL. Uh, Joel Brown, former Kingston Canadian, Ottawa 67, and Kitchener Rangers. Some of you may remember the name. Tough as nails, school teacher now, great guy. His brother Andy was with us. And after Canada made it 3-2, he said, well, maybe Jack went upstairs to do something about the game. And it kind of broke the tension. As you know, we came back. 
tied it, went down again. Uh, actually went down 4-2 first, and then came back, took a lead, and then they tied it up again, and then yet again another 6-5 game. And on the play, on the goal, just to finish up here, yeah, for sure, Howard Chuck gave uh, Beekoff a tug there at center ice. I think it was about 70% hook, 30% uh, dive. But it was just one of countless plays that wasn't called over the three games. Could have been a call, should have been a call. In today's game, it's a call all day. But it wasn't, and it's just one of those ones that uh, goes down in history as a non-call, and uh, and the rest is history. Mario buries it uh, high glove on the drop back from Wayne. Mario really made the play at the blue line. Howard Chuck taking the face off, and uh, and 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 away you go. You know, away you go from there. So I I think in terms of um, of uh, selection of personnel, I've never really been one to agree with the tact that uh, you should criticize if you win. Uh, you know, it's the old story if. Um, you know, if, 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 you, uh, if you lose, say little. If you win, say less. You know, I, I mean, there's, there's not much more you can say. It was, it was the three greatest games ever played. The pace, especially in game two. And I watched that. I, like I said, I watched every second. It was frenetic. It went, there were multiple shifts where it went three to four minutes without a whistle. End to end. With extreme hitting. Mixed with cheap shots, dives, and stick work. All mixed in there. And a number, numerous, great plays down low offensively and scoring chances. And it was it was just unreal hockey. And the one thing about the recapping the panel did, even though it's eight years old, is you could feel it dripping from Mike Keenan and Larry Murphy. The pressure that they felt from the country, from Canada, from Canadian hockey to win. And then interspersed with that was James Duffy talking with Wayne Gretzky in today's time, in 2020, and, and uh, them, them talking about it. And what I liked about that is Wayne didn't necessarily go down that tact. He went down the 72 tact. If you watched it, you know what I'm talking about. And he said, Wayne Gretzky said, there'll never be another 72. 72 stands alone. It stands alone, Wayne said. But he, 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 and he said, we're very proud of what we accomplished in 87. And, of course, he's, he's always going to be on the humble side. Let's be honest. That was unfreaking believable. They were down 4-1 in game one. Came back. Lose it in OT. They, they, uh, they came back in every game. They were down 3-0 in game three. Down 3-0 and 4-2 and came back. Just like game 8-72. Game 8-72. They had three leads. Three leads on us. And we still came back, including 5-3 after the second period. And we still came back. It's a Canadian way. It was established in 1972. And we showed it again at the World Juniors this year. We're unfreaking believable how we do that time and time again. Almost nearly 50 years worth. And how many times could we cite in between where Canada came back in various international levels of competition, including the women in 2014 in the Olympics. Are you kidding me? They carved their own niche in Team Canada hockey lore. So it was great to watch. I really, really enjoyed it. Man, that was something else. So I'm really thankful that, uh, that they did that. Hopefully we'll see some others. Wouldn't it be something to see Game 8 and 72 and, uh, and have, the, have the country watch that? You wouldn't see anywhere near the same pace. But the drama is there with the uh, J.P. Parisi incident just three minutes in. And on Cornway's tying goal in the third period, and the incident with Alan Eagleson and swinging sticks at Russian military carrying machine guns. <laughs> Jesus. Gets me worked up. Anyway, last thing I want to say uh, about Bob Yor. So I'm on Instagram, and I got a message from a guy yesterday saying, Liam, uh, he, I don't think he identified his name. It was an, uh, not an anonymous account. Well, I guess it is in a way because you can't tell his name off it. Or I couldn't anyway. And uh, But I looked at his picture. Looked like a guy kind of around my age or whatever. I think his wife's in the photo with him. And he said, Liam, um, I was talking with Bobby today. <laughs> so I'm, just, like, I'm assuming the guy's a friend of Bobby yours. Pretty good start. I'm going with that. I mean, guy could bullshit and say that, but it seemed legit. And he said, uh, uh, I asked Bobby, what was the time of day? When you scored the goal. And Bobby said, oh, God, I have no idea. He said, there's only one guy who would know that. It's Liam McGuire in Ottawa. You got to get a hold of Liam McGuire in Ottawa. And the guy finds me on Instagram. I don't know if he, 
if that's the first social media site he checked or whatever, I mean, I'm on Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn, whatever. But he uh, finds me on Instagram, sends me a message. So I said, well, it's pretty cool. It was actually at 5, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And it's easy one to remember the time because the date was 5, 10, right? It was the fifth month, 10 day, 10th day. And the goal was scored at 10 minutes after the fifth hour. Uh, so, you know, well, not really the fifth hour technically, I guess, if you want to start from 12 a.m. So that wouldn't be true. But at the very least, it was 5, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and 5, 10, May 10th. Uh, so I think that's pretty cool. So Bobby's goal um, and the book, of course, I have here, forward by Bobby Orr, as I've shown before. And then here's the chapter. I'm just going to read a couple of these. So I came up with the 70 associations to the number four myself and a man from Sweden named Patrick Hudo. I always have to give some credit to. Here's a couple of them right here. Just uh, I always say the first six or seven when I'm doing the uh, doing some of the some of the public uh, acknowledgement of Bobby's Bobby's efforts at that time. But for example, a couple of the others here that I think just goes to show you how far Patrick and I dug down here. But uh, or was the fourth defenseman to score on Glenn Hall that playoff year. So when Bobby scored that goal, only three other defensemen had scored a playoff goal on Glenn Hall. By the way, the others were Barry Gibbs, Dwayne Rupp, and Rick Smith. So things, things like that. Four different Bruins scored game-winning goals in the finals. Johnny Busick in Game 1, Eddie Westfall in Game 2, Pie Face McKenzie in Game 3, and then Bobby in Game 4. Uh, you know, Boston outshot St. Louis in all four games. Little little things, right? That you think you wouldn't think to uh, to, to to dig in and look. Here's here's some of the last ones. Okay, you want to go right down right down the line here to what I was getting uh, through to where I figured we got to get to seventy. See if there's any way we can get to seventy. With the loss, St. Louis had lost four consecutive games in the playoffs. So you know that's the only time they lost four straight games in the playoffs. Four Boston defensemen finished the playoffs with fourteen games played. <laughs> Jean Guy Talbot who retired following the series, ended his career with four career playoff goals. This is the type of stuff that we were digging up for the 70 associations to the number four on, uh, on Bobby, Orr's, uh, Bobby Orr's great goal. And so I think that was, uh, that was pretty cool. And we'll go out with this here. Let's see here. I'll tell you what, it doesn't get any better. It doesn't get any better than that. It does not get any better than that. I do have a sad toast though to uh, to do today. Man, it's been a tough couple weeks. And uh Paulo uh Paulo Campania, brother of my dear friend Marco, uh Elaine Giacobi, wife of my dear friend Dennis, my god, Alan Dozwa, older brother of uh of Perry and, uh, or excuse me, of, uh, yeah, Perry and, and, and Tim and JP, Big Dozwa family. Um, a guy I want to toast right now, though, is Robbie Karkner. God bless all the souls of those who have passed. Robbie Karkner uh, was, a, uh, was a friend of mine that I played hockey with in the 1990s and sadly uh, suffering from some very serious mental illness. And if the last name sounds familiar, if you're a hockey fan from the 80s and 90s and 2000s, yes, he is related to the Carters that played. Matt Carter, who had the greatest 39-second shift in Ottawa Senator history, is a cousin. And Terry Carter, who played in the 80s and the 90s, went to the Stanley Cup Finals with the Florida Panthers, um, big part of the Flyer alumni back in the day, played in the Quebec Nordiques, played World Juniors Team Canada. That's Robbie's brother. That's his brother. So we lost his brother. And many of us lost a dear friend and... Robbie's wife and their families lost a family member, a very key family member, no longer with us, suddenly, tragically, and uh, 
despondently taken from us. And so I'm toasting everybody that I mentioned, but especially to Robbie. And for anybody, you've got to figure that some of this crap that's going on out here might have played a role in it because it can sure as be uh, depressing. There's no doubt about that. So to the souls we've lost, especially to my friend Robbie, uh, God bless you, buddy. I hope you're at peace now, but uh, boy, you've left a big hole, a big hole for many of us to try and pick up the pieces from. And we'll all try and be a little better to each other, hopefully. And uh, if anybody you think is struggling at all, man, weigh in there, please. Please weigh in there. God bless. G'day.